got a Sony Betamax to work on today. This one was given to me. I got it from an estate. This is an SL2500, which is the most complex design that Sony's ever had. That and the 2700. Very complex, very trouble prone. Let's check it out. Well, the Betamax man will be happy to see this one. Look what I scored. An SL2500 in the box. Ooh, like new. I don't know if it works or not. But I got... Even got the setup guide. This is not hi-fi, this is just a mono machine, incidentally. This was uh, before the hi-fi machines came out, and this was the top-of-the-line beta machine that they made prior to hi-fi. This machine has, let's count them together, the number of motors this one has. It has a motor for the supply reel. It has a motor for the take-up reel. It has a motor for the drum. It has a motor for the capstan. It has a motor to thread the tape, and it has another motor to operate the front loading mechanism. Six motors. That doesn't mean that it's any good. These machines had a ton of problems. And they were probably one of the more unreliable of the Sony Betamax machines. This one and the SL2700 was the same machine but with hi-fi and yes it was heavy yes it appeared to be very well built but they had a lot of problems and one of the reasons that Sony moved away from having the separate motors well we'll explain it going into this video but let's just check this one out and see what I got here so I got this machine and I got the, the box obviously and this machine once it's repaired will be going up for sale I'm sure and it looks like I even got a Sony remote control for it. RM124. Some idiot probably left batteries in it. Ah, they're all just, uh, Duracells have all leaked all over the place. Wonderful. So as I mentioned, these machines had a lot of problems. I'm not even going to plug this one in just yet. On the top, it had a Varactor tuner. You can set uh, 14 presets, you tune the voltage to 14 presets for the analog tuner, kind of useless now. In the front here you had the buttons for setting up the, uh, for setting up the timer, setting up the clock, bright and dim display. You had your inputs for camera, tuner, and line input. And on the front here you had controls for play, rewind, fast forward, stop, record, pause, swing search. And then you could go one frame at a time, forward or backwards, step, or one-tenth, one-fifth, one time, and two times speed. It would play back beta 1, but it would record in beta 2 and beta 3 only, if I remember correctly. Yes, it only records in beta 2 and beta 3, but it will play back beta 1, like all Sony machines. Sony made machines for other companies, uh, namely Zenith, was one of them, and the Sony made machines for Zenith, well, they would not play back beta 1, They'd play back beta 2 and beta 3, but they would only record in beta 3 because some bonehead at Sony decided that if we were going to make machines for Zenith, we, we better make them not record as good a picture as a Sony machine. Even though Sony made the machines for Zenith, they crippled them by limiting the record to the slowest speed, which was a tactic that Sony did back in the early 80s to uh, try to uh, push up their own sales of their failing Betamax format and at the expense of the competition that they were making the machines for. And they wonder why one of the reasons it backfired on them. Now this machine has tape in it. I have no idea what's on this tape. This tape was probably recorded, you know, 40 years ago. I don't even know what year this is. I think there might be a date on the box. Let me look and see. March 26, 1982. I'm trying to remember what store this was sold at. 
because on the box this would have come from Sony. KD, Lansdowne. That's a mall. Shopping mall. I wonder what store was in there. I'm trying to think of which store would have been abbreviated KD. I think it's KD. 15742. That's the store number. I don't remember who that was. But it was a Lan it was a Lansdowne. And the date, 32682. So that's when this that's when this was shipped from Sony, Sony Canada. This was before my time at Sony. I was I was at Sony in eighty in uh, eighty three, and here the back's Canadian, right? SL twenty five hundred. You could stack twenty one of them high, right? And there's nothing else on the box that identifies it. Anyway, we know that this one's from 1982. I see. By the time I got to Sony in '83, the the, uh, the Beta Hi-Fi was was hitting the market. I was I, I was at Sony from uh, when was that Sony? October October '83 to uh, October '84 or September '84. I was there anyway. Uh, and the the SL5200 was out which was the 5000 series with hi-fi and then the SL 2700 followed which was almost identical to this one uh, this one's already had looks like the gears have been done on this because these originally had a plastic gear originally and these gears all broke on the front loading mechanism they were replaced with a metal gear that was held in place with a set screw I changed out hundreds of these another thing that was another real common failure on these was the guide pins would snap off so let's just take a look this has probably had the guide pins done on it I would think because if the uh, if the front loader has been done chances are the guide posts have also been done on it and I'm looking for a, a screwdriver that I can flip this open with this is one of the first VCRs to use a switching power supply that never gave trouble the little circuit board here is on a little hinge unlike the units that followed that blew up like crazy and uh, have they been done or not well they haven't been broken that's for sure this is the voting motor here the belts actually still in okay shape that tape probably got a permanent indentation from the uh, way it's been sitting threaded for the last 40 odd years so you got one motor here one motor here one motor here that's three another motor there four and then the reels each have a motor on each of them and I think now that I've inspected this thing, it's it's relatively safe that we can plug it in. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any parts that were broken and so forth on it before uh, giving it power. So let's just plug it in and see whether it does anything. So the first thing that lights up is the clock lights up. This had one of the most beautiful clock displays of any of the VCRs that I ever remember seeing. It was a nice deep blue. It was a fluorescent display, it's just they had a nice blue filter. A lot of them had like the ugly greenish blue or no filter at all. This one here had a nice filter on it. When you turn on the power, you get hours, minutes, and seconds. It's a real-time counter. And the power actually turns on on this machine. Let's just see whether the tape transport is going to do anything when I press play or any other function. Let's try, uh, let's try rewind. Well, it moves. It moves. How about fast forward? It moves them fast forward. I'm going to uh, play this tape. I'm not going to show you guys what's on the tape until I've had a chat chance to check it out. I don't want to be. I don't want to be shocked to be anything on this tape. So it could be porn for all I know. I don't know. That's to say, I just I just got this machine. Um, it was just given to me, and uh, and I can't even plug in the uh, audio because on the old Betamax they used RCA type plugs for video but they used a mini plug for audio so I can only plug in the video out or use RF I'll plug in the video out and uh, I'll preview this first before showing you guys if it's something that's okay I'll pan the camera does this thing play 
for all I know it could be soap uppers. And uh, that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like soaps. So, ooh, yeah, nice noise. Let's take a look at the picture. So, oh, you know what that is, right? Sticky shed. Sticky shed, shed syndrome on the tape. But the thing, the, the fact that this thing still plays, this is on the buses. They have on the buses recorded on beta. United Buy and Sell Service. Uh, I remember that, that the commercials. There might be some classic commercials on this thing. That black plastic arm on the left side you see moving, that's the tape tension regulator. It operates a magnetic sensor which controls the torque to the supply motor. There's no brake. Lots of dropouts on this tape, but then that's to be expected. This mechanism was ahead of its time. Unfortunately, there were a lot of issues using these direct drive motors. And that's why they went away from them. It had nothing to do with the cost. It was problems with high-grade tapes. Brown Brothers Ford, they're still around. I just want to see what channel this thing was recorded off of. <laughs> Live, Regis and Kathy Lee on Channel 12, KVOS TV 12. Hey, that's, that's old. Because, I mean... Well, Regis has been gone for a few years now. And there we go. On the buses, obviously, I can't show this. Slow motion. Um, it's not going to work very well on a digital display. On an analog display, that would work a lot better. But uh, uh, obviously, this tape is in pretty bad shape. You can see all the dropouts on here. Either that or this tape was recorded on a Super Beta machine. Um, because uh, you play, if you played a Super Beta tape on a regular Beta machine, it ended up with what looks like dropouts, just like that. So, um, pretty rough shape. Anyway, let's uh, try a different tape. So here's the mechanism when it unloads. Oh, well, it's an L830. The guy's got a number of 583. Did he have that? Did he have 583 uh, beta tapes? Some of the collectors did, but uh, this tape is say is pretty pretty old. It's an L830, which is the longest tape they made. It looks like it's a tape that they use for time shifting. Look at the surface of the tape; it's all rippled on the top. This tape's had a lot of miles on it, which a lot of Beta tapes did. Because believe it or not, uh, the people that bought Betamax machines they uh, tended to be people that did a lot of time shifting, right? People that rented movies didn't buy Beta machines because you know, there weren't as many movies around on beta as there were on VHS. So they tended to buy a VHS machine for renting movies. People that did a lot of recording, time shifting, a lot of them went with beta because beta had a better picture than VHS. Simple as that. So people would buy them for the picture quality and use them because of the picture quality on them. And uh, you find people with beta tapes that tended to have tons and tons of miles on them because they reuse the same tapes over and over and over until their tapes wore out. I'm just looking at this drum to see if it's got any any extra any wear on it. Uh, this one's been resurfaced. I probably did it. Anyway, I may have worked on this uh, in the past. I guess there's a way to find out. If I open up this plate here and see if it's been marked. When I took the drum off to resurface them, I always, I always marked where it came from. No, the drum won't fall apart when I do this either. There's another set screw back here, but I always mark them in a specific way. And uh, if I see my marking underneath here, then it's it's a good chance that I worked on this and repaired this unit in the past. If it doesn't have my mark on it, then somebody else did it. and it does not have my mark because when I did these when I took the drum off I typically put a couple scratches like this on the drum so that when I put it back together I could get the alignment exactly correct this one doesn't have the marking on it so somebody else um, took that drum apart on this one 
Could have been done at Sony for that matter. But what we used to do on these ones is the, the big problem with the uh, this particular machine and the SL2000. The SL2000 is almost identical to this one, except for it's only a two-head. This is a three-head drum. But the um, SL2000 is a uh, five-motor, four-motor solution. So take up and supply reels each have their own motor, and um, the drum and the capstan and the uh, loading motor. The only difference on this one is it being front loader. But other than that, they are the same. The, the problem with this design and why it was such a bad design and why everybody else that made units like this was also in the same boat is if we look down back here, you'll see the motors. They're actually underneath here, but you can see the rotors. If we look down the corner, right down in through here, you'll see the rotor. Right, and there's another rotor over there. These are direct drive. They spin the entire uh, rotor assembly spins. The problem that we ran into with this design that wasn't supposed to happen. It was actually supposed to load the tape. This does have a problem. It's not loading the tape. And I thought I was going to get off easy. There's a switch that is not being activated. There are two switches of interest on this mechanism. There's one switch back here which it, 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 it activates when the mechanism is fully loaded and then there's a switch down here. You will see if I if I move the mechanism away from its fully unloaded position you'll see that the switch activates and it's a good chance that that switch is not indicating that the tape is in its unloaded position. There's also a couple more switches on the front loading mechanism which could uh, be causing us trouble. Just going to try activating the switch a few times and see whether that will. Make this thing work a little better. Okay, now will it load the tape? No, it's not. So it's going to be a switch on the front loader that is telling the, telling the system that the, the tape is actually loaded when it's not. That's running back too far. We need to pull the front loading mechanism out and check the switches on this side. First things first, I have to remove the front panel. Already somebody's removed a screw from here. It hasn't been replaced. Okay, so we able to remove a couple screws here and this whole basket should lift out. Jeez, it's been so long since I've taken one of these apart. I forgot how many screws I gotta come out. I gotta pull the bottom off and I gotta pull the board out on the right side and uh, there's four screws, two accessible and two that are not easily accessible on the front loader. So these are two of them that got to come out. And we'll get to the other two in a second, but I got to pull the bottom off first. So let's do that and pull the front face off. So here's the bottom. The two motors for the take up and supply, drum motor, caps and motor. Now I can release the front panel. See the front panels held in place by these little catches. You have to take the bottom off to be able to release those catches in order to remove the front panel, which has to come off in order to remove the uh, 
He said Baraskin. Sony always had a sense of humor when naming their boards. This is an FU3 board. Front board also has to be flipped out of the way. Fortunately, Sony tell you which screws to remove. That one, that one, and one up front here and one over here. And then this board can be lifted out of the way because this has to come out of the way as well in order to uh, get to the end. Th these are wonderful. You see Sony use these, these composite modules that you'll never ever find ever again. And they put these fine little modules in here all over the place. And a double-sided board, which was another pain in the ass because they had a lot of problems with them. Um, these boards were quite fragile. And the fact that they use a double-sided board in a lot of places, um, there was a lot of component or board fractures. You get these units just bumped a little bit the wrong way and the board would break. We lift the board out of the way and I should be able to lift this out. I think there's another screw or two I gotta pull out of this thing. I gotta find them to lift this mechanism out. There are two more hidden screws that you have to move the, the uh, basket in because there are two more hidden screws that you cannot access when the tape is in the ejected mode. One on this side and one on the other side over here. You actually have to put the basket in, partially in to get at. And of course, of course the screws are going to come out with the screwdriver. These are a JIS screw, they're a 1.5, so they're between a 1 and a 2. And they're a pain taking it with the Phillips. Because they're JIS screws. They just have a tendency to cam out easily if you're not careful. There's one. Let's get the other one out over here. This one's already stripped. So we're going to make it fun. should be able to lift this basket out but else is holding it up the metal linkage in here it's going to be disconnected too there we go come apart come apart damn it there we go that should lift out now there we go so there's metal linkage here they have to undo this it's a uh, cut washer has to come off. Actually, it's not a cut washer. It's a retainer clip. Not not exactly a cut washer. You got to remove that. Well, what this does is, this is tracking the movement of the pinch roller. So when you're ejecting the tape, as the tape ejects, it pulls this lever back like that. This lever, and that pulls on this lever here, which releases a a latch. So there's a couple switches in here that can give us trouble. And that might be why this is not loading properly. I'm just going to make sure these switches aren't uh, aren't dirty. We'll give some give a shot of cleaner or just operate them a few times. Clean up the contacts in them. Because the way this was behaving, it's sure behaving like a switch is not in the right position. Sony on this machine made it overly complex. It's kind of stupid, if you ask me. Yeah, that's my opinion of this. It's a stupid design. There's a switch under here that's activated when the tape gets pushed in. On this side, there's a lever down here that activates the switch. And there's another switch on the other side when the tape gets pushed in. Right? That's what this that's what this wire across the top is for, is to interconnect those switches. It's connected to this this flexible wire that is uh derives the signal over to uh this board. So the, the switch is on the basket, as you can see here. There's a switch there. On this side, it's connected over here to this switch. I guess they're in series. Maybe not. Are they in series? Yeah, they are. When the two switches are both engaged together, that indicates that the tape has been pushed in, and it's been pushed in straight, and it's not at an angle. That signals the microcontroller that it can start loading the tape. And then I say there's a there's another switch up here, and there's another switch over here. So you've got two switches here, a third switch here, a fourth switch here, a fifth switch here, and a sixth switch over here. And any of those switches can uh, cause a problem with the uh, the operation. So I just operated the switches a few times. I just want to put it back together here, sort of. 
and uh, we'll see whether it uh, does anything different this time. Gonna have to reinsert that lever over here onto its pin. throw a couple of screws in just to hold the basket in place and I'll see whether the uh, unit behaves any different. I'm convinced it's a switch that's not working properly and that's what's causing the uh, unit to not thread. It'd be nice if I had the right screwdriver for this. Under two different boards. Just make sure that that's not touching anything. Should be able to power this up now and have it should retract and kick the tape back out, or the mechanism should. Turn on the power. There, okay. Now, what I want to know is will it thread a tape? Yes or no? Aha! now threading a tape. Why is it not threading the machine? As I say, this was not the Sony's finest achievement in reliable mechanisms. This was probably one of the poorest ones I think that they ever made. Okay, this is the lever that activates to eject the tape. Uh, this is what's pulled by when the pinch roller fully engages, it pulls this lever back. This is the one you have to disconnect. Pulls this lever back, which of course pulls on this lever, which is what releases the latch that holds the tape down. And I just removed the cut washer as I want to inspect this lever and make sure it's not bent in any way. So we'll take that apart. We'll take that off like this. So I want to look at this lever and see if there's any warpage or any twist to it. Because that could certainly uh, cause it to stick. Especially if the cassette drops onto it and stops it from moving into position. Then it won't load. See, when the mechanism loads down, when the tape goes all the way down, this latch moves forward. It presses down here and this latch moves forward and locks. So this little clip here locks down on the front loader to hold it down. And then when the, when the tape gets ejected, when the pinch roller fully retracts, it pulls this lever, which shifts this, this plate back to release this latch. If I were to wind the cassette basket all the way down, you'll see what I mean. If I put power to it here, which way am I going? Wrong way. Try this. If I put power to this, you'll see what I mean. It goes down like that, you see? And then when the tape gets ejected, this lever gets pulled, and that also activates the switch. So when the, when the uh, tape gets ejected, this lever gets pulled, which opens that switch and also releases this latch and allows the cassette basket to lift. Until this latch releases, it cannot eject the tape. So if this, if this gets trapped in any way underneath the cassette, for example, if this gets pinched 
under here so that it can't move it's never going to thread so this has got to be free running right here it's a bend in it intentional so there should be no stress whatsoever if this is if this is pressing up at all this is not going to move and if that doesn't move it's not going to load as i say very complex overly complex mechanisms on these sony's and uh, you know, people wonder why everybody hated to work on these things you have to release that catch like like even to even to operate the mechanism okay uh, let me zoom the camera back of it so you can see but if i want to if i want to release this tape if i don't pull this lever it's not going to do anything it's just going to stick right can't go anywhere i actually have to release so i'm going to pull this down again here okay now i can release this so i have to release this catch and then the power comes on to raise the cassette up say not my uh, favorite the 2700 was another pain in the butt stupid mechanism Sony had a lot of dumb mechanisms just overly complex for what they really were trying to accomplish the 5000 series was probably the more reliable or the most reliable of them all and uh, they wanted to make these slimline machines so they wanted to go to a, uh, a slimmer form factor and that's what this design is so I'm going to plug the plugs back in and we'll give the unit power. Before I give it power, I have to make sure that I'm holding this flap up, otherwise it's going to break it. Or it could break it, it'll jam it. So power up. And this should reset the mechanism. Oh, wait a minute. Better not do that until I put this little clip on over here. Also, if the other side of this is bent, and if there's any warpage to it, it will also cause a problem if it lifts this up in any way, shape, or form, so that it jams. Put the cut washer back on there. Okay, now we'll power the unit up and reset the mechanism. power on and this should reset okay now let's see whether this is going to do anything different this time when I try to load a tape will it thread or is it still going to do the same thing there now it's threading will it play I broke my cable. Okay, eject. Aha. Now it's working. Load. I gotta get a new video cable. When I was maneuvering this around, I broke my video cable. If I hold it, I get a picture. One of the things I always liked about Sony was the fact that the boards could swing up out of the way, like for servicing. Except to make sure, and then it'll stand like that, right? They had a built-in prop. And then you just move them over a bit to get the release the latch. Like that. As long as it was lined up here and on the pivot here on the hinge, right? You just lifted it up, the board would sit. So you could work on it. That was one good thing that they did on this and the SL2700. Was it was a very serviceable machine. Because you gotta remember, these were expensive. This machine was probably two thousand dollars or more. Well, it was more than two thousand, guaranteed. It was more than two thousand. I broke my cable right back here. If I do this, it cuts in and out. 
I was maneuvering this thing around and I had the, I had the plug plugged in. So I guess I gotta get a new cable. But anyway, lift and turn. And then the screws go back in to hold the board in place. Now these machines all had this little plug and I never quite figured out what this is for. But there's a little plug here. Well, you have to lift the board up, but there's a little power plug there and it has power on it. I never figured out what that was for, whether it was for a preamp or something for the tuner, but they all had this little, the little DC plug right there. I think it has 12 volts on it, if I'm not mistaken. Just, just sitting there in the board. Like, hello, what's that for? Right? They all had that little plug there. I have a feeling there was a, maybe a preamp, like for the tuner, that was available. Oh yeah, it says two booster. I wonder what that is. So they may have a little preamp that, 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 that sat back here and that was the power for it. I, I, I think, I think that's what it was, but I don't know. Anybody else know? I've never seen one, but they all have that little plug there. So I was thinking maybe that's for a, an antenna preamp that was in some markets. Anyway. I can put the front panel back on this one now. Just goes on just like that. I probably should have checked this before putting the bottom on. I assumed it was my cable that was bad, but you know what? It's actually... The jack is loose on the back. So we gotta pull the bottom off this thing again and repair the jack that's broken free. So, right down here is probably where it's cracked. Although it's not doing anything when I, when I wiggle the connection on the, on the board, it's on the, the uh, plug, it cuts in and out, but I don't see anything. I don't see anything loose here. down here. It's this one here. That I suspect is bad. Okay, well, I'll give it power and see whether I have a picture. Okay, now I have a signal. It's it's the ground, see? I moved the ground. The ground pin is, is broken on here, so let's just fix the ground. It's just the ground, so let's fix that one. Yeah, you can see it right there. Right there, you can see that one. So I'll just resolder that one without taking this thing apart any more than I have to, which is basically this. Oh, my iron's gone to sleep. Let's turn it back on. Forgot about that. That's the only, only downside with this this fancy iron that I've got is it uh, goes to sleep after three minutes and then after I think it's five minutes it shuts off completely. So which is nice because they don't have to worry about leaving a hot iron that can be a fire hazard, right? But if you forget about it, it shuts off and then you gotta give it a few seconds to warm up again. Okay, here we go. I'll do the other side as well, the input side. And this one, which is the input jack. I'm sure it's fine. It hasn't been used a lot. It's just the other one, people plugging and unplugging, right? Okay, how's the picture now? Perfect! Picture looks great, no interference. Put the bottom back on this one again, and uh, we'll do a recording and play test. So we'll clean the head on this unit. Not that it was really that dirty. I'll make a test recording. I'll just use the tape that was in the unit.
and I gotta find an adapter to plug the audio in so that I can play the sound back through the TV. I'm recording something off of uh, my uh, media player. Okay, that should be enough, I would think. Let's uh, play it back. And there it is. It plays perfectly. Complete with dropouts because you know it's an old an old tape. But there we go. This machine is playing perfect. It's recording perfect. And now it's loading and unloading the tapes correctly. Let's put it back together. Let's get a the screws in to hold the circuit board on and uh, put the top on it and this one will be ready to go to a new home at some point. And then I can start going through all the rest of the stuff that I got from the great estate that I went to. I was at the estate today going through the rest of the stuff and uh, I'll have some stuff to show you uh, coming up in future videos. I've got uh, picked up several VCRs, a couple DVD recorders, um, and uh, a couple of an amplifier, a couple tuners, CD players, um, Betamax, reel to reel. I even picked up that old Edison phonograph that I showed you guys the picture of, and that works. But I have to get a piece for it because it's a Edison diamond disc player and it has the diamond pickup, the diamond reproducer, which won't play conventional 78s. It was for the Edison format records only. So I'm going to have to look and find a 78 adapter so that I can get that thing working to its potential. And we'll do a video on that. It's in pretty good shape. The grill is missing that, that goes over the horn, but uh, other than that, it's actually in fairly good condition and it's worthy of a restoral. But I gotta find some pieces for it, namely the adapter, so that I can play conventional 78s. Because I got a ton of 78s, I have like hundreds of 78s, and uh, this would be kind of cool to be able to play them on an actual period piece that you wind up. Anyway, this one's done. But just before finishing up on this one, I just wanted to show you guys how quick this thing rewinds and fast forwards. So, tape loaded, fast forward. Moves along pretty good. If we look at the counter on the front, how quick it's moving. He knows how quiet it is. I think it has direct drive motors. Go to reverse or rewind. Go to play. And there's a basketball game on this tape. This is the tape that uh, was in the machine when I got it. It's a uh, playing great. The Lakers! I uh, better not show that. You know, uh, NBA might get upset just for showing a couple frames from a, a basketball game that was put on TV like 40 years ago. <laughs> anyway, this one's done. Just gonna throw the top on it and uh, get this one back in its box and uh, get it ready to uh, to sell oh you know what it's not ready it's not done because I still got the remote control that I have to uh, to fix up for this one this one the batteries went bad in the remote but you know what maybe we'll do that as a, a separate remote I think we'll oh, maybe we'll do that one as a separate video I think we'll do that as a separate video this one is uh, all done we'll catch you next one bye